Hi, folks. Um, thank you for joining us for the Hive Mind. Um, I'm Daniela with Open Signal. Um, the Hive Mind is our immersive media artist talk and discussion series um, where we dive into the intersection of art and technology and the social implications of virtual reality. Uh, this month, we are super excited to have Nancy Lee with us. Nancy Lee will be talking about their work and their upcoming workshop with us. Um, Nancy is a Taiwanese-Canadian interdisciplinary media artist, curator, filmmaker, DJ, and cultural producer. Um, their work stimulates and enlivens space making a provocative statement about how inescapably interconnected we are with our surroundings. Um, so um, we're going to hand it off to Nancy. Um, I'd like to mention that if you're watching live with us, uh, feel free to drop any comments or questions you might have um, in the chat. And after Nancy presents, will be addressing all of those. So feel free to interact with us um, in the chat. All right, thanks for joining us, Nancy. Hi, everyone. Uh, thank you so much for the intro, Danila. Um, and thanks for having me at Open Signal. Um, I'm super stoked uh, to be here. Um, so yeah, I'm just going to dive in uh, to um, my uh, presentation. And yeah, please. Um, if no, if it, you have any questions or anything that we have a Q and A um, in the end, I think I'm going to be going through some of the material pretty rapidly, um, just because there's quite a bit of material to cover. So yeah, if you got any questions, just hang on to them, and um, I will make sure to answer them afterwards. Okay, I'm just gonna switch over to my presentation screen. Cool. Um, so my name is Nancy Lee. Um, this is an image, um, a, a screenshot, screenshot from um, what, what I will be teaching, teaching um, in, in the next, next coming weeks, weeks um, um, introduction to A-Frame, um, um, uh, uh, which, which is a, a platform, platform you can use to uh, build, build web VR, VR environments, environments with. with. Um, so I will kind of kind of go through like my journey of like how I got into um, we, VR and like uh, immersive media and the various, various projects uh, that got, that got into, into where, uh, where I am today. Um, I started in 2016, 2016 um, doing some 360 uh, dance, dance video, video uh, research, uh, research. Um, and, now and now I've been, I've been moving, moving on to um, web, web, um, web, web VR, VR web, web XR, XR uh, just because of Corona, corona. Um, and, um, and um, you know, you know accessibility, accessibility reasons, reasons and, and you know, you know um, also, also just, just like, like health, public health reasons and not sharing headsets and stuff anymore. Cool. So, so the first, first project, project that I've ever done, done is, is a um, 360 uh, contemporary, contemporary dance film. film. Um, so what you see here um, is the trailer. Um, you can't really hear the sound uh, just because it sounds a bit quiet, but I could just kind of talk over it. The film is called Title Traces. Um, I did it with in collaboration with a choreographer, um, Emelina Fredrickson, and um, three dancers, Les Durian and um, Zara. And the idea, the the process of making this project was doing a year-long dance residency um, at the dance center um, in Vancouver, um, as, uh, figuring out and researching how to choreograph for a 360 environment, um, just because 360 environment um, is a very different kind of space um, than, you know, traditional dance film, which is something that I had done previously, especially with making music videos um, and things like that. Um, so the first question, I guess, when we kind of start working with a new medium is why 360 video? You know, why not traditional dance film? Like, why are you using this medium um, to convey your project or express what you're trying to do? Um, you know, like the reason why we were thinking about doing a 360, 360 video is that at that point when we were doing our research starting in 2016, a 360 um, dance film that is made for 
the 360 medium has not really been made. Like there has been lots of documentation, uh, 360 documentation of existing kind of like ballet or dance performances in theaters, but it's, you know, it's done in a way that it was meant for the stage or meant for live performance. There has been many 360 um, performances that have existed before, like in terms of a live or stage setting, um, but for something where the choreography was meant for a 360 camera hasn't quite been done in 2016 yet. So we were like, okay, let's do this because we wanted to experiment and learn um, what we can learn about the medium itself. So one of the main questions um, for us when we were making um, this project um, is how do you create something that's rewarding for the viewer regarding, regardless of where they are looking? So the thing about 360 um, video or VR or any kind of immersive media where the viewer has a decision to kind of access different um, non-linear non um, narratives or just like even looking in different directions um, you can you can't really control where they're looking so like how do you how do you design a virtual environment or space um, or a performance you know where you can give them a rewarding viewing experience for example um, you might have a dancer um, that is you know you have three dancers scattered in your 360 environment but your viewer might just be looking at the ground for the first like two minutes of your four minute dance film. So what are you gonna do um, to kind of compensate for that or to make that a rewarding experience um, for the viewer? Um, and like, what can you do with your chosen medium that you could not do with, uh, uh, with the other mediums that you've previously used? Many people that work with immersive media come from other media, uh, other media art or film or uh, sound backgrounds or like installation backgrounds. So like, why is this medium that you're choosing to uh, use different um, than other mediums that you've, you know, previously used before. So for us, like, as you see in this picture here, in this image, we were at the intertidal mudflats of Boundary Bay, which is this bay, uh, Boundary Bay area um, in Tawasin, um, near Vancouver. And um, the reason why we chose this site is because you can see the horizon and you can see water, like, all over, like, all throughout. Um, it has, it's like an intertidal mudflat zone. So the, um, water is very shallow at a certain time um, of the day during certain times of the tidal chart. Um, so that way, um, the viewer not only will be able to enjoy the dance performance, they can actually enjoy the atmosphere and the environment um, which the uh, location of the dance film is situated. Um, the reason why we want to do that because we want the environment to be a rewarding experience. So because of this, because the dancers are dancing in water, because the viewer is situated like on top of moving water, the viewer has this perception of constant moving water beneath them. So even if they were to not look at the dance performance and to look at the environment, there's constant movement that can kind of draw their attention to it. So in a sense, um, the, the viewer is choreographing a performance um, every single time they watch the film based on where they're looking. So every single time you watch the film and your eye movement looking at different areas, you discover something new. So that makes it possible for the film you watch, watch uh, many, many, many times. Um, and the thing about choosing the medium, the reason why we're doing 360 film um, and not just like regular dance film, um, you know, some of the first VR experiences that I experienced was kind of like some of the New York Times, like VR 360 video experiences. Um, I was like, okay, that's really interesting. The, I felt like the most rewarding pieces were the pieces where it can like transport, trans, transport me and teleport me to like a different environment. So that's why we're like, okay, if we're going to shoot this dance film in 360, we got to pick like a very different environment that most people have not experienced. So we're like, okay, let's choose the middle of the ocean somewhere where you can see water all around. Um, and that's like an experience that, you know, many people can't experience if you don't live by an ocean that has intertidal mudflats or if you had accessibility issues. This way we can bring live performance um, that's site specific into the theater, into like a film festival, into someone's home in their own devices. So when we first like developed this project, we were like, okay, let's develop a language uh, for uh, choreography and for directing um, because it was the movement of the dancers was like a, this new experience. So we're like, okay, how do we figure out how to direct our dancers and like what kind of movement should we have? So we kind of this is um, just like a page out of Emily Nutt's um, uh, notebook, um, just kind of like figuring out how to choreograph um, the dancers. You know, like 
positioning and we developed lots of like science fiction language, um, you know, like array or like clusters and things like that uh, to, to let the dancers know what we sh uh, what kind of movement we would like them to move in. So inventing the new language, because at this point there hasn't really been any language uh, to use uh, to direct in uh, dance in 360. Um, and a big part of it was also experimenting how to choreograph um, for a 360 medium. So we did these workshops at the dance center during our residency, inviting different bodies, like just open to the public, anyone could come um, to come and experience um, the, like we had a camera and then the 360 camera in the middle. And then we had like all these moving bodies and Emilina would direct the bodies and be like, okay, everyone let's like run in circles. Let's run through the center or like some people running through the center, some people running running around a circle. And a big part of our research was looking at gaze. Like, okay, like um, let's look at the camera now. Let's look through the camera. And then we, um, we analyze the footage afterwards to see what, um, kind of results we got from it. So we spent a lot of time playing and experimenting to figure out what type of choreography we wanted to include in our final um, 360 dance film. So, so when I first, first um, developed this project, um, we didn't have any funding. Um, we were just experimenting. Um, so I got a 3D printed, um, like 3D printed, you know, 360 camera. I just looked this up on the internet. Um, and we got this like 3D printed uh, rig with six GoPros uh, that I just like bought off eBay. And um, this is kind of like, you know, it's a six camera kind of setup. And this is like the very basic kind of setup that we had. And I feel like at that point, um, there had been some like uh, 180 cameras. We we're thinking about maybe getting two 180 cameras to do it. But, but the, the thing, thing is that the resolution was not quite good enough. enough. And, you know, you know coming, coming from like, like a, a film, film background, background, I still wanted to be able to like color um, the footage. I still wanted to shoot raw footage that we could play with the tone and the color and stuff. So we decided to go the harder route and have better footage um, using uh, these like, this is a, I think the GoPro Hero 3 at that point. So it was kind of a tedious experience, um, like, you know, putting this together at that point. I think nowadays we have all these apps that can just stitch everything and all these cameras that automatically stitch everything for you. But at that point, it was six cameras with six separate micro SD cards that I had to load into my computer. Um, and this was during one of our first like demo shoots in 20, in the summer of 2017, July 2017. Um, this is at the beach, um, you know, just loading all of the stuff into my computer. And this is like, you know, charging the six cameras. So there was a lot of challenges um, using this setup at first because j just managing like data, managing the footages, like labeling everything, making sure all the footages are um, worked. Um, also making sure all the cameras worked. I think the biggest part of it was like a lot of times we shot, one of the cameras would be busted and we're like, oh shoot, now, now we only have five cameras and like the footage is no good. So we got to drag our footage out into the ocean again and reshoot again. So we encounter lots of like technical difficulties um, through this process, but we were still able to get some good footage. So we were able to use the footage that we captured here and create like a one minute demo film. Um, which we eventually used the demo film to pitch the National Film Board of Canada. Um, so, so we're like, like okay, here's, here's the demo film, we made this with, with this, this like crappy VR rig that we, that we um, you know, you know filmed ourselves. ourselves. And, and then they, they hooked us up, up with, with the GoPro, GoPro Audi, uh, which, uh, which is a 16 camera, camera uh, stereoscopic, stereoscopic 360 rig. As you can see in this image here, it's this big kind of, this is a GoPro Odyssey, and it uses the Google Jump, which, which is, is like cloud stitching. So, Hooray, we didn't have to deal with stitching, stitching anymore. Um, so, so what, what this camera, camera does, does is that, that all of the cam cam 16 cameras, cameras so essentially it's looking, looking in eight, eight different, different directions, directions um, with, with uh, uh, stereoscopic. stereoscopic. So, so it, it, um, it captures the left, left eye and, and the right eye in every single um, direction. And um, the, the rig, rig is already, already built, built in a way that it can like, like sync all, all the cameras. cameras. Because before, when, when I built that six camera, camera GoPro setup, setup, we had to individually turn on and record every single camera. camera. And oftentimes, you know, some issue would happen with the car or the battery, and, and one, one camera would fail. But with the 16 camera setup, it's already um, connected together, so it already syncs. So we just have to press one record, and the whole uh, rig will start recording. So that really saves us a lot of time um, and like technical errors. Um, one, one of the biggest, biggest challenges, challenges um, with, with this kind of setup, uh, with this camera, as you can see, this is blue Tupperware box, box below, below um, um, was, was like, like, where, where are we going to put the battery, battery pack? Because like, like with the other, the other setup, setup that I did, um, that, that we, the six, six camera, camera setup, setup, the batteries, the batteries were the GoPro, GoPro battery. battery. 
and, and that, that was chill, chill um, because, because it's, just, it's like this like super, super easy rig, rig. we just tossed it on a tripod, tripod. we carried it out, out of the ocean, ocean. And, we and we threw it on the ground, ground. and we shot, and we shot. Which, is, which is just it was annoying, annoying to have to, have to, have to do the, the, the button pressing and recording. But now we've got this bigger rig that requires a big battery set up. Um, so, so we're like, like okay, okay, what do we do with, with the rig? rig? Um, so, so we came, we came up, up with, with a very high-tech high tech idea of putting it in, in a Tupperware. Um, in the ocean, with using, with using electricity, electricity and technology, and technology in, the in the ocean is just, is just challenging. challenging. I, I, I know I something that, that I, didn't I didn't really think, think of. of. We're, we're like, like, oh, great, it's such a great, great idea to shoot in this like, like, very, very novel site. site. Um, and then as we kind of developed the project, it was like, oh, wow, it's super challenging. But we, but had, we to had to hide, hide the, the, um, the, battery the battery in the, in the Tupperware, so it didn't get wet, and I didn't want to get electrocuted. And this, and this was, was the only camera, camera we had, too. Um, but, but the problem was in the ocean, the ocean the Tupperware, Tupperware was plastic, so it floated. So, it floated. so then so we, had we had to, like, put, put sand, sand into, into the, the Tupperware, Tupperware to weigh the uh, Tupperware down. down. But then the then battery would overheat. So then we also got dry ice to put it in the Tupperware just in case the battery overheated. And then we had to carry this extra battery uh, Tupperware with our much bigger uh, GoPro um, Odyssey setup um, into the ocean um, using like tidal charts to calculate uh, when the tides came in and when the tide was at the exactly right height. So we would carry all the stuff out into the ocean while the tide, while the ocean was still like waist height. Um, so by the time we got, we walked about like, you know, I don't know, like a couple hundred meters maybe even 500, 500 meters to like a, a kilometer, like, like out into the ocean. Um, so by the time we got to the site that we wanted to shoot at, the tide would have moved out enough so the dancers could dance in it um, at ankle level. So just lots of tidal, moon chart. It was almost, yeah, it was like period math almost. <laughs> um, and um, yeah, so and then like one of the biggest things that we didn't really think of, it was like, oh shoot, where do our crew go when <laughs> we shoot in the middle of the ocean. Um, so we had to get the camera started and then we ran um, like hundreds of feet out into uh, the water and the sandbars and laid in the water, uh, hoping that the camera would not capture the crew members. Um, so um, so what happened was that we we tried to strip down the crew to as few, as few people as possible. It was just me, um, technical director, um, Olivier, and um, um, one PA, and then Emelina would come later on with the, Emelina was a choreographer with the three dancers much later on because the dancers had to stay warm for their bodies to be able to perform. So we would go out there first and get our rig set up, and then we would, I would text the Emelina and then get the dancers to walk out um, after when everything is all set to go. So then by the time the dancers got there, they could just drop the robes and perform. Um, the thing is, uh, with the dancers um, having to kind of manage uh, their own performance, um, our role as director and choreographer, we are no longer to dictate what they should do um, in like, you know, there's no mics, there's no, you know, there's no speakers or anything. So essentially for the rehearsals um, period, we had to empower the dancers for the dancers to make their own performance quality decisions. And then we, and we developed some kind of sign language because we had to be so far away from the dancers with the camera. Like I would go personally start the camera, but then when the dancers started performing, I would run all the way out and lay in the water. Um, with the dancers, um, we developed some um, kind of sign um, gestures. So both, both hands, hands um, up, up, it means, means that, that the, the um, uh, uh, dance performance is, is good with, with one, one hand up, up with the, the dance performance, they want to re reshoot, reshoot that, that sequence, sequence again. again. So, so that, that way they, they can signal, signal to us to let us know um, what, what their performance, performance quality was. was. So, so a big, a big part, part of our role as director, as director and choreographer became facilitators. facilitators. We, had, we had to become emotional, emotional support, support for them, them to make, to make these creative decisions, decisions because, because we weren't able to make the decisions, decisions for them because, because we were so far, far away. And, and um, mind, mind you, the time only, we only had um, a 30 minute, minute window each day. We had two shoot days and we only had a 30 minute window each day to capture um, their performance because that was the perfect level of tide. It just, the, the water just made things a lot more challenging. Um, but so we had to really lock down their performance. Uh, the film was a four minute uh, dance film, but you know, even with two 30 minute periods, that's not a lot of tries for them to lock in the, the performance that they want. Um, so the thing with creating this thing was that we kind of came across lots of different um, 
ethical considerations, you know, things like cyber sickness um, was a big part of like our ethical considerations because like with a lot of other VR experiences we um, did was like we got sick looking at it. So we're like, okay, how do you make it, um, how do you make the viewer comfortable? This is such a new medium. Um, I've, at the, in 2016, we felt that a lot of the, the VR 360 video pieces, pieces it, was it was kind of like shock kind of pieces. pieces. There's, There's lots of like, you know, there's, there's just, just lots of like, um, like, like sudden movements, you know, there was lots of horror stuff. There was lots of like discomfort, discomfort um, and things that were captured in that way. Um, but we, that wasn't kind of the piece that we wanted to make. We wanted to make something that was like a serene experience where people felt like they couldn't escape to like a different world that was serene. Um, so the comfort of the viewer was a big thing in terms of uh, figuring out the choreography. So in the dance mode, which you can actually now see online at the National Film Board's website, if you type in title traces, um, the, uh, the dancers start very far away from the viewer. So when you first uh, land in this environment, in this like uh, kind of serene ocean environment, you don't really see the dancers. Dancers are standing really far away in three separate directions uh, with their backs turned towards you. Because what we realized when we were doing our research was that eye contact and showing of faces kind of triggers like a psychological response um, from the viewer. So we wanted to kind of come in as soft and like as lightly as possible um, so the viewer felt comfortable and had a little bit of time the first 30 seconds to get acquainted um, in the environment um, in the film. Um, and also the, a big part of the ethical consideration was like the comfort of the performance because with a lot of 360 films it's like you can't um, you can't direct your performers because maybe you're in an environment where you got to hide uh, or you, you can't be in the scene. Um, so, you know, uh, providing the performers with um, like pro providing the performers with uh, enough direction during rehearsal um, so then they feel comfortable performing because as a dance performer performing for an unknowing viewer like an unknowing eye is really difficult because as a live performer you can usually see the audience you can see where the audience is looking even in the 360 live performance you know where the audience is looking so you know how to be on but with the 360 um medium is that as a performer you have to be on all the time because you don't know where the audience is looking so you're so it's actually a much more exhausting experience for performers to perform for this environment because they have to just be on there's no hiding because you don't the audience could be looking at all times based on their viewing patterns um and the big and another thing is like at when we made this in 2016 which is we first started doing the demo 2017 2018 um is when we start touring the project it's a pretty new medium for viewers. A lot of people haven't seen, haven't used VR or used 360 video. So uh, a big part of what we were doing, we had to play the role of educator too. Um, and we had to, you know, showing the work, bringing the work to different places. We had to talk about the medium itself and also the discussion of like the ethical considerations where I felt like it was lacking in a lot of the discussions about VR um, or XR or 360 video. Um, so, this video is just another video. It's a next my next project in 2018, which is done in collaboration uh, with a collaborator of mine, um, Kieran Bumber. It's a virtual reality uh, live musical performance. Um, and this was uh, done with uh, in collaboration with JP Carter, a trumpet performer, who performed, performed live in, in an 8.2 channel sound system, system where the audience sat in the middle with VR headsets on. Um, so we developed the, uh, the environment in Unity, um, and uh, you know we had the sound um, developed. Kieran Bumber, who is a composer and sound designer, designed the sound, um, and the sound was separate, um, in, running on a separate, completely separate system um, that ran through uh, the 8.2 channel sound uh, system. So a big part of this performance, is, as you can see in this video, is like where is the viewer looking? So every viewer is. Um, experiencing a novel experience because, because uh, uh, JP, JP Carter, Carter, the trumpet performer, performed and, and improvised with, with the viewers. viewers. So, so the different viewers, some viewers were, were very active, active spun around, around a lot, lot and like stood up and stuff like, like that. that. Some viewers were, were very still. still. And, and based, based on, on the viewers' body, body language, language it, it informed JP's improvisation. So every, every uh, performance was, was unique. Um, and the viewers, the viewers had, had they, were they were able to, to see, see a, a um, virtual, virtual environment, environment in, in their, their headsets, headsets. Um, um, 
and, and some, some of the game, game objects in the headsets, headsets because the Oculus Go had mics on them, them um, were, were sound reactive. reactive. So, so based, based on how, how their heads were turning, turning um, their, their experience, experience of the surround sound, sound composition and JJ's live trumpet performers, performers as, as he moved through, through um, the audience members, members uh, kind, of, kind of created this like, like novel experience. He also made a lot of like different sounds, like non-Trump sounds too, like sounds that were like bubbly. He played, he put some water in his trumpet, just playing with different kinds of experimental uh, sounds during uh, the performance. So, so yeah, we wanted to create a collective VR concert experience um, because, you know, throughout touring Title Traces, we realized like VR is such an awkward experience at film festivals. You got this awkward lineup and then you got like all these people like waiting and watching you got all these people waiting in line, watching the person watching the film. So the person watching the film became a spectacle on its own. So that's why we wanted to experiment with this because we're like, there's so much value in collectively witnessing something. Like when you go to a concert, I'm sure now with Corona, we all miss that. It's like when we go to a concert together or when you go to the theater together, you have the interaction before the performance and you have the interaction, social interaction after. So this kind of brought people together um, to have the shared experience um, so we wanted to be able to do that with VR. We wanted to be able to do that, uh, to create a shared experience. So with the 8.2 channel sound, we have Trumpet Performer with four tube amps that JP also has. So there's lots of sound because this is, we wanted to make sure this is like a musical experience because VR often is seen as a very visual medium, but we wanted to utilize VR to support a musical um, experience. And then we had eight network Oculus Go headsets. So these are Oculus, I think they're discontinued now, um, but these are wireless headsets. Um, and we had them networked with a, into a computer that, that was running a client network system in Unity. So the headsets were all launched um, at the same time. So everybody had was able to experience um, the visual environment collectively um, at the same time. And all the visual design was cued uh, to the music, uh, to the bed track of the music. Um, this is just um, um, I an mean, image of what it looks like in, uh, in Unity. So the sound, we called it, we, we like to speak in the language of choreography because with 360 environments, we talk about sound choreography because now we have sound in this, like so much sound sphere in this eight channel um, area. And then you have JP Carter, the trumpet performer and his four two bats. So there's so much sound moving out, moving around. So uh, Kieran Bumber um, used um, the uh, Reaper and Ria Surround to control the audio spatialization um, for the performance. And then um, After Effects to create the visuals. We created um, in collaboration with Lane Butler, a visual artist. Um, and then I edited the visuals um, in Premiere Pro. Um, and then we exported the visuals just because it's hard to edit things in Unity. We export the visuals and mapped it, mapped the visuals as a skybox um, in Unity. So as you can see in this image here, um, there's this like, uh, purple and blue background in here, that's the skybox. That's the environment that you, the virtual environment, like the infinite background that you would see um, in Unity. And this is um, this is a game object that we have here. It's actually the fog. So a big part of our project was also playing with the fog choreography um, because we wanted to be able to create a sense of depth and space in the environment as the audience members um, were in uh, uh, is experiencing um, the visual element of it. So we moved the fog up and down so people felt, um, you know, their proprioception, their proprioception was um, impacted by how the fog moves. That kind of created different feelings in your tummy uh, when you kind of, you know, still gentle. Like I think I'm still interested in creating works that are gentle um, to the viewer. Um, but it, yeah, it kind of created this like internal movement in your body as you experience uh, the piece. Um, let's see what is next. Okay, so the next thing um, I want to, it's my most recent music video. Um, it's um, a music video done, um, it's all done in VR, uh, but the actual music video is just, you know, it's just a regular music video, um, like, that you see, like, on YouTube, but the entire environment uh, was built um, in Unity. Um, so the idea with this was use, how do you use VR tools to create something that is not VR? Because the things VR tools are actually very useful, uh, to be able to, uh, you know, oops, sorry, my bad. Let me just go back to this. Um, so yeah, VR, uh, VR tools is actually really useful. So I'm just going to kind of skip to, uh, 
some of the elements of it. So this is actually like the game object that we built and we brought in into, into the environment. environment. And, and the, the reason, reason why, why we're using, using this um, tool, tool Unity, Unity to build, build because, because now, now we're able, able to kind of, kind of use let our imagination, imagination run, run wild. wild. So we can, we can now um, um, create set because I'm, I'm like, like you know, you know in, in, when, when I used to do music videos, we have to build, build set and like, like hire our apartment and build things that are you know platform or scene. And, and sometimes, sometimes really, really costly, costly um, and it takes a lot of effort to do, and you, know, you can't defy gravity, and there's, there's a lot of restrictions uh, with physics and gravity. gravity. So, so with this, um, I was able to build my set, um, my music video set, in Unity and in VR, um, uh, where we can defy gravity. And we were able to bring in Noble Oak, who's the artist here, um, using this um, software called Depth Kit. It's volumetric video capture, so it's like using um, uh, like a uh, infrared and camera, like the Microsoft Connect V2, uh, to capture him, um, and then we brought him into uh, this VR environment um, as like a game object. So you know, so there's still some like human likeliness um, of the artist itself, but then we can also apply all these, you know, these cool shaders on him to kind of change the effects, and make him look much more um, ghostly. Um, but using this, using these VR tools. Now I was able to, you know, defy gravity and create some environments that, let me just kind of skip to certain parts, um, where you can have more than one version of him in the same scene, you know, which is something that, you know, would take a lot of compositing if you were to do that, you know, green screen and video. But now I'm just able to create these uh, shapes where, you know, he can be on every surface level uh, without, you know, defying all the rules of gravity. Um, and then, then I worked, I worked with um, another, another artist uh, to, to help me develop like, like a VR, uh, like, like in Unity kind of VR cinematography, cinematography rig, rig, where I, I use my Oculus controllers, controllers uh, like, like a camera, um, um, to, to fly, fly around, around my the VR environment that I've constructed to record um, while I was like flying around shooting. shooting. So, so essentially, essentially, we kind of developed the whole um, um, music, music video, video set and, and developed, developed tools um, inside, inside Unity. Unity. I, I, I recorded, recorded the entire video, video in Unity. Unity. Uh, like how you would do like in a production. And then with all the recorded footage, then I brought the footage into Adobe Premiere and then edited the music video uh, that way. So as you can see, you can see his like, you know, there's all these like different effects that we can play with the shaders um, and stuff like that in Unity now. And, um, you know, we were able to also, you know, play with like different shapes. These are like um, game objects that Lane Butler designed in Cinema 4D. Um, I can show you, I'll show you later in my, um, other videos documenting how we made the project. But yeah, like we're able to do things that you cannot do um, in a regular music video shoot, but also still have the kind of likeliness um, of the performer without having to like, you know, animate a whole different character um, in this music video. Okay, so let me just, you know, switch screens right now. Um, so, this is, I'm just playing on my Instagram because, uh, you know, I'm a millennial and it's 2020 and this is the only documentation I have, but this is like, you know, Lane designing like um, a game object um, and, and then I'm just like, dis, uh, I'm, I'm just deciding like, like what, what shapes, shapes I want. So it's, it's actually an animated, animated object and then I pause the animation of the object to decide what part of the object I want to use. Um, this is me experimenting um, um, with, with uh, the volumetric, the volumetric video. video. I'm, I'm trying, trying to get that, get that up. This, this is just me in my studio, studio space, space and just and trying just to figure out like, like, how, like, how to do the volumetric, volumetric video stuff. stuff. Um, um, as you can as see, see, you know, there's you know, some depth, depth element that volumetric, that volumetric video. video. And this, and this is, again, again you know, you know, figuring, figuring out how to create like a stage or like a platform that we want to want a noble low form on. Because the idea is that I wanted to him on different surfaces and I want to fly around to record that. This is just, you know, experimenting with shaders. You know, I have myself volume volume video and experimenting with different kinds of shaders for my body. This is like actually me recording him. Like he was just performing and I was just spinning him on a chair. Um, but, but this is like bringing him the first kind of initial part, bringing him the volumetric video into Unity um, and kind of just experimenting with that. So I was like, oh, maybe it'll be cool if I overlaid a bunch of him together. Um, and this is kind of just showing him, bringing him into Unity, into the game, as game objects, into the different platform and positioning him in different areas um, in Unity. Um, just to skip through some of this stuff because uh, I'm explaining here. Um, but yeah, this is like bringing in, 
um, the real life artist uh, using like volumetric capture um, and bringing him into uh, Unity. So this is like just a capture of him, which has got a depth map on his body, but also a, a camera photographic capture on his the color of his. So using the the, the camera component of the um, connect to capture like the colors um, map of his like body. So, so once, once I put my, my headset, headset on, I just use these um, controllers to kind of like fly around in the scene. So if you can see in this here, this controller is in here and you know, you can play with scale and how the, my movement and things like that. And then my right hand, so that's my left hand, my right hand is where this camera is. So you can see this little tiny little viewfinder here. Um, so I can move my arm around and um, record and pretty much fly around with my left hand and use my right hand to shoot what I'm moving, how I'm moving around um, in the scene. Yeah, so like there's, and there's like different kinds of effects that I had on the buttons that were set. So, you know, there's like effects like cutting out the skybox or so making the skybox black. Um, and then there's uh, buttons that release that as well, that make the skybox, um, uh, you know, do different like chromatic effects on there. Um, I'm just going to uh, move over to uh, talking about my next workshop. Um, so I'm just going to let this kind of load for a minute here. Um, but what I'm going to be doing with um, uh, Open Signals, I'm going to be teaching this like live, this introductory to web VR workshop um, using A-Frame. So A-Frame is a like HTML based like um, web uh, development. It's, it's like a tool for you to actually use an HTML to create a VR environment. So it's, this is kind of like, you know, something that you would see kind of like a game, you know, you can move around with AWSD, like, you know, a regular like RPG game. And then you dra drag your arm or uh, drag your uh, view around using your mouse and your cursor. Um, and in here, this is, I'm working on um, a platform, it's a collaborative platform. platform. It's, it's kind of like, like Google, Google Docs for like, like coding apps. apps. Um, so, um, so it's like a, a web, web app collaborative platform, platform that, you that you can build projects in. Um, and this is the, the code. code. So, so as, as you can see here, you can like, what, what, what's, what's really cool about this is it's all HTML, um, pretty basic HTML. Um, and uh, you can, um, live see kind, kind of, of the scale, scale of things. things. For, For example, example, like, you know, these, I'm mean, kind of in this like trippy mushroom environment, you know, like I can, you know, there's, they're called dressings. So if I move the scale down to like five, for example, whoops, I just broke the thing. Uh, oh, there you go. Um, so if you like, right away, you see, oh, you can't. Um, so this is like a very useful tool um, to kind of bring in uh, experience, uh, just like web VR just like web VR cool thing about this, cool thing about this is that you can also um, use this and use this put the web, put the web, put the URL, URL into your phone, phone and experience, experience it as like a, as like a mobile, mobile of VR, VR experience. experience. You, you, you can't, can't really, really move around, 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 there's around there's there's to that, but you can, you can, you can definitely like move, move. Rotate, rotate around, around um, um, in your, your phone, phone um, to view the experience. So it's, it's kind of cool, cool to, to be able to do both, both um, and, and to, to have, have it uh, interact, uh, so, so interactive and so live, so, and, and being able, able to collaborate on an app with another person. So, so this, this is, is a workshop, workshop that I'm going to be teaching with Open Signal, um, and uh, yeah, that kind of concludes my presentation. But this is just my quick contact. Oh, oh shoot. shoot. Conversation. Whoa. Wow. Thanks, <laughs> Nancy. I'm going to just forget about that for a sec. There's so much going on there. Um, really amazing work. Um, I'm going to start off with just a couple of questions um, that yeah, came up sure. during your presentation. Let me just pull them up real quick. So, uh, this first one is um, about title traces. Yeah. Um, so you mentioned um, while you were presenting that you had, uh, was how many days did you film? Um, two days. We had two days to film, and we had 30 minute win title windows for the two days of film. So we got there like obviously like hours, hours earlier because we had to do makeup, hair, all this stuff. 
Um, but the tidal, you know, because the tide would go out, so the, the tide had to be right and the sun had to be right. So there's only a small window where the tide was right and then the sun was right because we can only shoot with the tide going out. So we would chase the tide out as we uh, as we shot in that 30 minutes um, because with the tide coming in, it actually became way too dangerous and challenging for the dancers to have way more resistance on their body. And also this like, you know, it's like a 20,000 camera rig, like potentially dropping in the ocean. So we couldn't do that. <laughs> so you've ended up with an hour of footage at the end? It was that. Because we had to set up um, during, during the, sh the 30 minute window. So we still had to set up, um, you know, and then they performed for a couple minutes and then we had to run back in, take the camera, chase the tide out because then it would get too dry. Um, so it was like, it was much less than that. Like I had much less, you know, maybe like 20 minutes of footage at the end. So that 20 minutes of footage, um, so since this was 2016, you had basically kind of created your own rig for this, and then we didn't have like the plugins for the editing software that we have now. So how long did it take you to edit those 20 minutes of footage into that? Oh my gosh, you don't want to know. Like, <laughs> the project was 16 terabytes, just because it was stereoscopic, it was shot in 8K. So um, like even to transfer like from a hard drive to another thing, like, like, it was like, like okay, okay, I'm just, just going to transfer. I'm going to come back tomorrow morning, check. And, and this, this is, like, on USB 3. Um, so in order, order to edit, edit, honestly, like, like the, if you watch the film, like, like there's, there's only, like, seven, five cuts, maybe. maybe. Like, like, we had, had to really know what we want before we edited it. Because even when we were doing, because we had to do some rotoscoping at the end. So, like, um, uh, created... Um, Creative technologists at the NFB helped with some rotoscoping um, because there was too much sandbars. Like I was like, oh, I didn't really like the sandbars. It didn't look watery enough. So he had to like implant water into it. And that process alone took like a month just to do um, because it was stereoscopic. So we had to measure the distance between the two eyes at the fur di furthest distance. Um, so there's like some calculation and the and there was no software for it at that time. So the rotoscoping was like all super manual. And then we couldn't export it too because it would um, fail every time we tried exporting it. So then we would, um, when we exported it, we actually exported it frame by frame. So like one image at a time, frame by frame. And then we put the film together frame by frame. Wow. So, <laughs> so a really long time. <laughs> yeah, like I think that post-production process took like um, a total of, I would say like four months. Mm -hmm. It wasn't full time, but like it took like a four months process to make like a four minute thing. Um, but at that point, I believe Adobe owned the company that it currently it bought out a company that does all the 360 video stuff. Um, and but at that point, it was two separate software, so there was just it was just un resolvable like crashes and plug-in bugs like constantly and just like work around like deep into like you know forums like figuring out like why is this is not working why this is not exporting mm -hmm. well um there is another question um and this is in regards to how you were talking about how you had to run to the horizon line and hide um do you know if you have any information now about um, directors who are working in 360 um, using a green screen suit to aid and being able to be on set without having to hide? Do you heard of anything? Yeah, like I that? mean, that was definitely something that maybe we could have like done and thought of, but like it was, we were all wearing wetsuits too because, because it was cold, cold in the water. water. So, so I, I guess, guess you, you could, could wear a green suit, suit over your wetsuit. Um, but I think the, ch like now if I did a 360 thing, you know, like I would maybe like create a fake rock to hide behind or something like that, you know, or like, you know, like create some kind of fake barrier to kind of, if I didn't have the resources to do like a horoscoping or the compositing in After Effects. Um, but at that point, you know, honestly, like we didn't even realize that until like the day of our demo shoot, like in 20, in 2017, when we were like, oh shit, like we don't have anywhere to go so we just have to lay in the water that is wild um so one thing i was really thinking about while you were talking is um you know with your first project working 
in 360 and VR, um, it really seems like you were um, finding the tools to create this project. Like you obviously were 3D printing stuff, you were making a 360 camera from all these GoPros um, and, and, and just rigging things as you were going. Um, and as you've kind of been moving throughout your career, incorporating these technologies, like have you seen, um, or can you talk about how sort of the technology informs the direction of the project or how the project informs like what technology you're using? Um, I'm sure as all this kind of accelerates that that, that process kind of changes. Yeah, um, I think it's like, I think with the 360 dance film one, that one was specifically like, we wanted to do 360 because we wanted to do like specifically dance film, um, but in a 360 medium, because I was working with contemporary dancers that have all worked on dance films. Um, so we wanted to like create that. So I feel like for that particular project, it was like, we knew the tools we wanted. We knew we wanted to do 360 video for that. And we knew the tools that were out there, but we just had to kind of bridge the gap and figure out how to build those tools ourselves. Because at that point in time, we did not have access to resources. You know, further on, once we developed the demo and stuff like that, we were able to access the National Film Board and all their resources. So we had better tools and we had production team to help us develop that. But I think it really depends on the, I think at the end of the day, it, it seems like the limit, the real limitation is like, the re access to resources, really. It's like what resources you have on hand and what can you make um, using the resources you have access to. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, do you mind if I ask like what is kind of on the horizon for you as far as working in these mediums or do you have any kind of projects that are um, kind of bubbling up? I'm sure every time I start talking, I'm like, oh, that's right, the pandemic. But so that is affecting things, but do you have anything in the works? <laughs> Yeah, I have a um, exhibition, solo exhibition um, in collaboration with Kieran Bumber. She's like a longtime collaborator of mine. She, she did the sound for Title Traces as well. She's a sound artist, um, composer, performer. And um, she, her and I, we have an exhibition at the Richmond Art Gallery. Um, and uh, it's a speculative science fiction piece um, in the year 3000 um, after like a post air apocalyptic world um, where like, humans are stuck indoors um, inside because there's so much air pollution out there and so much like diseases out there that people are siloed and isolated and connect to a cyber world and only develop relationships with each other through the cyber world uh, connection. Um, and in this um, story, this is a narrative kind of like exhibition. So it's a trans uh, media ex exhibition. But in this story, like we are, we, we are trying to figure out how we can tap into like our ancestral memory through touch, which is forbidden in this world, um, which we eventually do like a wedding uh, ritual um, and like a live performance um, uh, like it, as like a resistance against um, the state of that world. Um, so in the exhibition that we have like a some two channel films, multi channel film, multi channel sound installation. We're also doing some like 3D printed uh, through white light scanning of our bodies um, and 3D, 3D printing, printing like sculptures, sculptures of our bodies. Um, and you know, just designing, designing an, an XR environment, environment as well that, that like, you know, talks, talks that, that addresses, addresses um, the, the, the piece is called Union, um, but addresses the, uh, like our union in the year 3000 and what that means as we like participate in the resistance against um, that that world where everyone is connected to the cyber world. So we're trying to have a relationship with each other physically um, outside of the realms of the cyber world, which is like um, governed by like surveillance capitalism and, and all that, you know, bad stuff that we currently live in right now. But funny enough, that story actually, we, we actually wrote the project and figured out the story before COVID happened. So as COVID happened, we're like, oh my God, this is so weird that this all this shit is happening. and. It's like we're living in the apocalyptic world that we were writing. So that's a project for next spring, next April, that will a uh, six week ex six week exhibition that will be showing. So I'm currently just like building the different film, like writing narratives, character development, and then she's doing the sounds. The I think she's going to do a 16 channel sound installation, um, like projection mapping and um, yeah, and just like the sculptural um, element. And we're going to do some XR stuff too, just because like with uh, COVID. COVID 
um, we want to be able to bring some more online into like a more immersive uh, format. Um, just so I'm just kind of had a question about kind of your own development as an artist. Um, I think I read that you maybe come from a filmmaking background. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, like how did how did that process go? Like, like clearly it looks like you have a, a, a lot of experience with scans um, and then you're moving into this more interactive, immersive um, experiences. Like kind of how did that um, roadmap work out for you? Yeah, so I, you know, I was interested in documentary filmmaking first. That's kind of like my in enter, my entrance point to art making. Um, and uh, I think like I, I developed a project in 2014 with Kieran called Pendula and it's an interactive swing installation. So with filmmaking, I kind of got into like video art and like DJing and stuff like that. So I designed this and I was throwing like parties like back in the day, like raves and stuff like that. So, um, so within that kind of like doing raves and things like that, I did a show where I installed a bunch of swings at a, at, at a, like, a space. Um, so we had a dance floor and then we had like a swing space. It's just a bunch of like swings. So all the people were like playing on the swings and, um, I was really interested in, I had projections there too, but I was interested, I was, I noticed that people were interacting with such a, such a, like an, um, equilibrium way, like people weren't bumping into each other and somebody would get off the swing and another person would jump on and it would like re like stabilize. So I was like, oh wow, this is such an interesting, like social kind of like um, dynamic here and I was like I wanted to be able to figure out how to measure that and like project that onto um, like into projections to kind of maybe like uh, calculate and average the motion of people and like kind of project the social behavior of these people in the swing area onto the swing and I met Kieran at that party she was like on the swings and then we connected uh, that way and she was like hey like I actually have the skills to program the gyroscopes and use Maximus P to like scale the rotation and stuff and you know map it to like vj softwares so then that's how we started collaborating uh, creating like immersive environments where we have like projections and swings and then through that through creating immersive works um with like new media and you know interactive art um i think like and then with my film things i was directing music videos and stuff like that i think naturally when vr or 360 video came into place it was like it was just like a natural thing for me to want to explore that where i was like okay there's like Cinema, cin cinematic elements. There's a linear, uh, many times like with 360 videos, it's like a linear story, um, so which is much like film. But then you have this like interactive element with immersive environment element where you really notice your body. You know, with immersive works, often you the thing that makes it different from cinema or like going to the theater is like you notice your body a lot more. Um, so I was like, okay, well that's why I was like wanted to explore the 360 video stuff because it just felt like I was doing all this movement related uh interactive work um so i was like well why don't we yeah do vr stuff and then i think after that i just kind of it just been developing and technology moves so fast too so it's like 360 video stuff that i did in like 2017 is like not even relevant today in some ways you know it's like all the technology is like you have softwares i'll just do everything for you now so um yeah it was just like figuring out that progression awesome um that reminds me that I would love to hear you talk about current because, um, you know, obviously doing it like open signal doing events like this and and seeing folks like me doing this like is really kind of breaking down the barriers. Oh, I think a lot of us don't have that much exposure to this kind of technology, um, you know, because most of it is, you know, more like it's being developed and built for industry so advertising and, and mostly advertising <laughs> but um yeah like so a lot of our first exposures to this like on a personal uh, level where we're actually interacting with it is through art um so i know that I, my first 360 video experience was seeing title spaces um at when i went up to vancouver for current Oh, cool. that, was, that was really cool. You know, I'd never seen anything like that before. I'd never put on a headset before. Um, oh, cool. so it was really awesome. And then to see, you know, like you and Kieran working and kind of advancing the uses of this tech was super cool. And yeah, I just wanted to hear you talk about current and how that developed and what it is. Um, because I know personally, it was super inspirational to see 
this kind of new, like just seeing all, you know, women and non-binary folks and just like people of all different identities that I didn't normally see, you know, using this tech and um, really like evolving it. Um, yeah, so yeah, just can you talk about that space in yeah. the project? Yes. Thank you. Um, that was actually the demo film that you saw at Kern, because at that point we just shot the demo, like um, oh, wow. in 2016, uh, 2017. So the piece that you saw was our demo film that we took to use to pitch to shoot the second version of it. Um, but yeah, like a, a current um, symposium was uh, co-founded um, by uh, me, um, Ashley Luck, and um, Soledad Munoz. Um, and uh, we started in 2017, and we wanted to like, kind of create this like music festival, art, electronic art festival um, for women and non-binary folks. And like we, uh, that, that year, 2017 year, we, co we collaborated with uh, Tuff in Seattle and then S1 in Portland. Um, so we brought you guys all up here to play and to kind of just like, you know, get involved with the stuff that we're doing here. Um, so a big part of like my art making um, comes from like uh, kind of doing cultural production and community work. Um, because, because like a lot of like, like I, I met here in Ad of Artie, you know, I met I met, I met a lot of my collaborators, like, like the visual artists that I work with, like, like all these folks are people that I met in in like a uh, community and music and art context. Um, so I think it's like a great way to be able to meet people that you vibe with or, or, and that are, and are like on the same wavelength because like, like, those, those are the kind of people, people you want um, on, on your on your projects. projects. But also, also like, like it's also like a learning, learning experience too. Like like with current, you know, we did. Um, you know, we you know, did like, like multiple multi scenarios. scenarios. We, we had, had like film screenings. screenings. We, we had, had that VRP. We had that installation. We had like, like panels, artist talks, and like um, Kieran also taught a synth building workshop, like a hardware workshop um, that year as well. And I think like a big, big part of it is also I think, I think mentorship is, is a big part of like. like what is needed in this type of, especially in emerging technology, uh, because there's no roadmap, like there's no workflow or roadmap to what you're doing. Um, the only way for you to learn is to, to is through mentorship, is to, through working someone with someone else who is more knowledgeable um, than you are. And I think it's just important in order for for us to up, uplift, you know, women and non-binary folks and, and artists of color is like we have to participate um, in this like mentorship um, as we develop the work we do. And it actually really informs like a lot of the kind of research directions um, in terms of like how we want to build our teams um, and how we want to kind of facilitate our kind of collaborative um, dynamics. You know, you know it, it comes, comes down, down to that because when, when you can, can bring, bring in people, people that, that don't, don't usually have access, have access uh, to, to these, these um, technologies, technologies um, and these resources, resources you, actually you actually create, create like, like really, really interesting, interesting works. works that, that is like, like cause cause there's so much, so much VR work and immersive media work, work. It's, it's all like, like work that's like based, based on like commercial, commercial stuff because, because, because like, those are like people that have access to this equipment but like for I guess Canada is a little bit different too because we help out a lot of access to public grant funding and it's something you know I think is really important as an artist to continue Continuously advocate, advocate for better, for better social, social programs, programs um, and better funding. And something, and something, and something I work with uh, the, city uh, the city of Vancouver, Vancouver on doing, on doing um, is, also, is also just like advocating, advocating and like, and like you, know, you know, creating create a connection with like, with like systemic, systemic and structure, uh, uh, systemically, systemically and structurally to like, to like advocate, advocate for better funding um, for people or for people that, that you know, buy BIPOCs uh, for like for women, women in, in uh, technology or non-binary folks in technology. So I think it's all kind of interconnected because as I do, my, my work, work and, and as, as I, I do, do the community giving way for, for myself, myself. like like uh, uh, to, be to be able to experience, experience because, because because like like I, 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 I can't, can't see myself in these festivals, festivals and in these things, things. Like, like the thing, the thing I, can I can do, do is create it you know DIY that shit, that shit and then just like create the space for it so it not only benefits you know the other people that you know are also don't have access to this but also it's, it's also, also like paving way for ourselves, ourselves you know, as like, like producers, producers um, that, that create this space, space because it, it also, also helps, helps us. It makes, makes this space like necessary, like necessary and, and people can see the benefit of creating this and people can build better programs like in the future. And it can also inspire like, like other emerging cultural producers, producers to run their, their own festivals, to run their own um, immersive media uh, programs and educational programs as well. Ding, 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 that is amazing i think that is a perfect place to um end this talk i really love that like that is i think 
so important and I hope everyone was listening. Um, and we don't forget that Nancy is teaching a free online workshop that starts November 18th. Um, it's two sessions and it is um, an introduction to web VR using a frame. So this is all really accessible stuff. Um, yeah, I dropped the link in the chat. Also, it is linked in the description of this. Um, so please, please, if you have any interest in it, please sign up. It's a really great opportunity. Um, yeah, thank you, Nancy, so much for sharing all of your work with us. Um, yeah, thank you. <laughs> thank you so much for having me. Yeah, thanks to everyone that's watching too. Um, and that concludes this edition of The Hive Mind. <laughs>